Well, it's time to kick off New Year's with a bang. I really don't know what my intros have become. In this penultimate episode of True Detective, which is sure to cause a lot of controversy, we are left with so many unanswered questions, the finale has a lot of work to do. Honestly, I'm just hoping it doesn't turn out to be aliens or something. We have a lot to get to today, including the Is Rose Real theory, how Peter solved the Wheeler case, and what's going on with Kate McKittrick and the mine. Also, if you haven't checked out my Is This True Detective Season 4 Killer video, I recommend giving it a look before this video, as it's still relevant going into the finale. Now pull the trigger on that like and subscribe button because here we go. The episode begins six days after Christmas on New Year's Eve. That's six days since the death of Julia Navarro who we saw venture out naked into the frigid tundra. Her sister Evangeline Navarro awaits her ashes, ashes she'll later dump into the frozen ocean. Last episode ended with Liz finding Navarro in a trance-like state with blood coming out of her ears. And I gotta say, I found it very frustrating that neither of them bring this up. We don't find out what caused this, and neither of them seem too concerned. Granted, six days have passed, but I would have thought the writers would have put a line or something somewhere to acknowledge the cliffhanger that was episode four. Meanwhile, everyone's favorite junkie, Otis Heiss, is now into his sixth day of withdrawal, and Liz wants to find out everything he knows about Raymond Clark, NSPD's prime suspect in the death of Annie Kotok and the Salal scientists. While he doesn't know where Raymond did, is, he says that Raymond wanted to know how Otis survived his injuries over 30 years ago. The same injuries of burnt corneas and ruptured eardrums his co-workers at Salal endured. Otis himself doesn't know how he survived this, stating that he ran out for help in a blizzard after a cave-in and woke up in a hospital with no recollection of how he got there. Raymond told Otis that he must hide because, quote, she's awake. This is a line we've heard throughout the season from Raymond himself. She's awake. Liz's son, She's awake. and this ghost-like whisper in episode one. She's awake. But who is she referring to? It could be Annie Kotok, but she's dead, in which case it would be a spirit. She could be referring to something more metaphorical, like Mother Earth, which is fighting back after the damage caused by humanity and the mine. But the strongest theory I've heard so far is that of Navarro's split personality. It's this other side that has awakened, although unbeknownst, to Navarro. Hence why Raymond has to hide, because Navarro will stop at nothing to get him. I made an entire video outlining this theory, which I'll leave a link to in the description. In that video, I talked about Blair, this woman with the cut-off fingers from episode one. Well, she makes an appearance here in the laundromat with Navarro. She has no lines and there isn't any reason plot-wise for her to be here. I mean, you could take her out of the scene and nothing in the story would change. Why would the creators spend money on this actress and put her here unless her presence signifies something? In episode 2, Blair is asked if she's seen this spiral symbol, and I'll leave it to you whether you think she's hiding something. You ever see anything like that double sign? No? So, when you're cleaning this- Unfortunately for Liz, the cave she's looking for is on Silver Sky Mine property, and when Liz and Navarro check it out, they note that it looks purposely sealed. Someone does not want anyone getting in. We'll get into who and why in just a bit. Meanwhile, tensions between protesters and the mine reach a tipping point. It seems no one is holding the mine accountable for the toxic water and increase in stillbirths. Thus, Leah, who is already on bad terms with her mother, meets up with Sherry to protest. A protest which sees her beaten up by riot police, saved by Navarro, and promptly arrested. Navarro is also haunted by a vision of Annie Kay. She's been haunted by all sorts of ghosts throughout the season, although I take these quote-unquote ghosts as more manifestations of her trauma and guilt rather than actual ghosts. After Liz gives up on the Annie Kay case, Navarro tells her she must now carry this guilt. You carry Annie. You're leaving her. Things are also falling apart at the Pryor household, where Peter's wife Kayla has asked him to stay somewhere else. The last time we saw them, Peter missed Christmas Eve and accused Kayla of resenting him for keeping their child. Why don't you just say it, that I ruined your life and you didn't want to have the baby? Uh, 
<laughs> Thus, Peter asks to stay with his father, Hank, and it says something about their relationship when both of them lie about what they're doing. Hank tells Peter he's working on his truck when he's actually playing guitar, and Peter lies about being five minutes away when he's already there. The only difference here is that Peter knows his father is lying, and I'm sure this impacts some of the decisions he'll later make. Liz is told by Connolly that she has to attend a meeting with Kate McKittrick, who at this point we can kind of assume is the owner or president of the mine. She is none too pleased about the recent protests, but as we'll soon see, she has an ulterior motive for bringing Liz in. But Liz is also armed with a new piece of information. Pete has linked the Silver Sky Mine to the Salal Research Station, with a shell company owned by Tuttle Industries. The same company that owns the mine dishing over the bulk of its funding to back up the mine's bogus pollution numbers. In my episode 2 video, I talked about how the Tuttles were a powerful family that worship Carcosa and the Yellow King in Season 1, which is interesting since the quote at the very beginning of Season 4 is from Hildred Castain, a fictional character obsessed with the Yellow King found in the works of Robert Chambers. Liz has Leah arrested, and I can kind of see where Liz is coming from here. Leah has continually disobeyed orders, was caught making porn with an underage girl, vandalized private property, and now assaulting an officer. Leah shouldn't get special treatment just for being the chief's daughter. A slew of shocking revelations occur when Liz meets with Connolly and Kate. I also like how you can still see part of the graffiti left over from a few days ago. Turns out Kate has been keeping a close eye on Liz and Navarro, with the mine security cameras catching them on private Silver Sky property. Kate sure wants to know a lot about Liz's investigation. That's because Kate is involved in the death of Annie Kotok, a known enemy of the mine. Later in the episode, we'll see Kate hold a secret meeting with Hank, essentially asking him to kill Otis Heiss in exchange for becoming chief of police. Otis is the only person who knows a different way into this cape, and if he's gone, whatever secrets lay within, go with him. This isn't the first time Hank and Kate have colluded. I'm counting on you. Six years ago, Hank was promised the chief position in exchange for disposing of Annie's body in that storage container. I do believe him when he tells Liz that he didn't kill Annie, that he just moved the body, because when he's talking with Kate, he tells her that he's not a killer. I'm not a killer. If he had been hired to kill Annie by Kate, he never would have said this. Although he never got that chief of police position due to the unforeseen transfer of Liz Danvers, he was compensated handsomely. Now, Kate isn't asking him to kill Otis outright, but there are other ways to take care of him. Like if he were to accidentally OD or try tragically get lost in the tundra. To make matters worse for Liz, the forensic results from the bodies sent to Anchorage have come back, concluding that an avalanche killed the scientists. Obviously, this is a completely bogus conclusion that stinks of Silver Sky tainting the results, undoubtedly paying the forensic analysts just like they paid the Salal scientists to produce results in their favor. Connolly wants Liz to put an end to the investigation, but when Liz fights back, Connolly reveals he knows what happened with William Wheeler, the man who allegedly died of a murder-suicide. We know that isn't the case. It is yet to be revealed who actually pulled the trigger, but Liz and Navarro killed him and covered up his murder. So if Liz doesn't stop her investigation, Connolly will look into Wheeler's murder. There are two questions likely going through your mind. How did Connolly find out about this, and why would he side with Kate in the mine? Remember that Connolly is running for mayor of Ennis, and that the mine is the lifeblood of the city. If he's endorsed by the mine, I'm guessing that would solidify his win. It's also nice for the police department to say they don't have a killer on the loose. As far as how he knows, well, this all hinges on Peter's laptop. Hank, unbeknownst to Peter, logged into his son's laptop knowing the password was Darwin's birthday. Inside, he found files and files on the Wheeler case as Peter was conducting his own secret investigation. You just had to know. I had to keep digging. That's what Hank found in there. Hank put two and two together, or at least just enough to inform Connolly. It's Pete, however, who really nails this case shut. Here's what he knows, that Navarro and Liz visited Wheeler ten times, likely for calls involving domestic abuse, so they know the extent of his violence. Both the bruises on his victim's face, which go right to left, and the gunshot wound on Wheeler's right temple indicate he was right-handed. But Wheeler wasn't right-handed. Using a high school photo as a reference, Peter finds out that someone had flipped all the photos to make it seem like he was, so that it would match up with the gunshot wound to his head. And it just so happens the ballistics and forensics reports were conveniently destroyed in a past flood mentioned in episode one. You took a bunch of case files home after the flood. 
I don't think so. But when Peter straight up asks if Navarro and Liz killed Wheeler and covered it up, we get a non-answer. You need to learn when to stop asking questions. Kate is adamant that Liz never find that entrance to the cave, so whatever's in there more than likely ties the mine and Kate to Annie's death. But how did the Salal scientists fit in? That's the big question. We do know the scientists were researching the ice and had equipment to dig into it, and I can't help but think there's a connection there. From Annie's phone, we see the caves have fossils buried within them, so that's another element yet unaccounted for. That also leaves us with Raymond. Is he really a bad guy working with Silver Sky to kill his lover, or is the show making him out to be the fall guy. Nothing like some laundry to kick off the new year, where Navarro has yet another hallucination, this time of hair. I'd consider using a different washer. This might be her mother's hair, as it's wet like hers and not blue like her sister's. There's still the possibility that Navarro killed her own mother years ago. We learn that her mother was murdered, but her killer never found. Kavik brings over a friend who knows more about that stone swirl she picked up from Oliver Tagax. It's apparently a warning sign to show hunters the thin spots on the ice. We've seen this symbol at the dredge, Raymond's trailer, on the forehead of one of the scientists, and as tattoos on Annie and Raymond. It's this piece of information that gives Navarro the idea of getting into the cave a different way, from up top through the ice. But when she comes to inform Liz, she finds Liz putting away the case files. Connolly has shut them down, and there's nothing they can do. We could also see a more close-up picture of those star wounds on Annie's body. If you watched my episode 4 video, we learned that these could be from ice cleats. That would explain the odd shape and 32 such markings all over her body. In this episode, we'll see both Rose and Navarro wearing such cleats while throwing away Julia's ashes. This scene is really intense, as it appears for a moment Navarro is transported back to her time as a Marine. You can actually make out a sort of Marine diploma at her house. This flashback has been seen all throughout the season and features a Middle Eastern type setting, a convoy attack, and a fellow soldier's head half blown off. If Navarro is indeed suffering from some sort of split personality in order to quell her trauma, no doubt this is one of those memories. Navarro is knocked out of the flashback as the ice beneath her gives way. Thankfully, Rose is there to tell her to lay down, a way to evenly distribute her weight to avoid falling through the ice. Now, one of the theories I've heard out there is that Rose isn't real, or at least is only visible to Navarro. Here's what we know. The only person to actually see Rose is Navarro. I mean, Liz walks past her in episode one, but doesn't acknowledge her. Now, Rose does seem to exist in this world because Peter mentions it was her who found the corpsicle. Rose Agonel, Chief. Rose Agonel found it. Navarro also tells Peter to take the dead bodies to her, so she's either A, alive, or B, a delusion shared by all of them. This is what's called folie à deux, a psychotic disorder in which two or more individuals share a delusion. And with the water potentially causing psychosis, I can't rule this out. Hank tells us this creepy story about how Peter almost died falling through the ice when he was nine. It's kind of ironic that the son he saved will later be the one who kills him. This type of injury also makes me wonder if Peter sustained any brain injuries being under the water for so long. Leah's released from prison and brought back to Kayla's where Liz barges in to talk. Leah can't imagine why Liz would side with the mind when it's so obvious the mind is at fault for the toxic water. Liz is caught in a tough situation. By law, she has to keep the peace, even if she knows in her heart of hearts the mine is up to no good. Thankfully, I think this relationship is salvageable, with Leah saying, You know, I haven't given up on you. I think Leah knows what's caused Liz to become this curmudgeonly old woman. No doubt the death of her husband and son, and here Leah tells us she's not giving up. I think a scene that's going to get overlooked this episode, but is rather quite important, is Liz visiting the coffins of all the stillbirth babies. It's this moment where Liz makes that internal decision to screw the mine and do whatever it takes to take it down, even if it means stealing heroin from the evidence locker to give to Otis and potentially losing her job. Peter is given keys to Liz's shed, which looks slightly warmer than my ex-girlfriend's heart. It's mainly a setup to have him at Liz's for the episode's finale. Meanwhile, Liz takes Otis home so he can get high in exchange for the location of the cave's topside entrance. As Navarro makes her way over, she stops and finds this child pointing at her, just like her mother, Anders Lund, 
Bond and others. I can't help but think this is foreshadowing what's to come. Hank has come to take Otis back, having followed Liz from the rehab facility. With him witnessing Liz leave the evidence room, it's also possible he knows she was going to get Otis high. As Otis makes a run for it, Hank shoots him, the sound prompting Peter to arrive, gun drawn. Throughout the season, Peter has chosen Liz over family every time, from leaving his wife to go to work when he shouldn't be, to shacking up in Liz's shed over staying at his father's. And here too, Peter chooses Liz. As Hank draws his gun to shoot her, Peter kills him. Initially, Liz wants to call Connolly, but if she does that, Pete will go to jail for the rest of his life and there's no question the investigation into Annie Kay will be terminated. So Navarro has a plan. Make it look like it was Hank who took Otis and shot him and then have Hank disappear. It's another cover-up. I mean, they got away with it once, why not try it again? Peter is insistent that he will clean and take care of the bodies. Perhaps this is his own punishment for what he did. And Navarro tells him to tell Rose to take the bodies to Julia, meaning into the ocean. The episode ends with Liz and Navarro driving off into a winter storm, most likely to the place Otis pointed to on the map. With only one more episode left, there's still a ton we don't know. What happened in Navarro's past? What happened to Liz's husband and son? And what awaits us in that cave? Now we venture into our last trailer sleuthing section of the season, where we take a look at the trailers to see what might be in store for us in the finale. I get the feeling from this shot that Liz has solved the case and she's meeting with agents to go over her recollection of things, similar to what Marty and Russ did in season one. It's also possible this could be a flashback from a previous case, but I like the first theory better. Notice how it appears to be daylight here, so some time may have passed from the long night. It's possible this may not even be an Ennis. Liz will make her way back to the Salal station. Notice her wearing a Salal scientist jacket. This is rather odd as we'll see her later at Salal wearing her white jacket, one in which she'll fall into the ice. Perhaps it's Navarro who pulls her out and warms her up by this fire, hence the change in jacket. Here we have Liz falling into either water or the ice cave. Navarro here looking like she's made it into that ice cave. I have a feeling we're gonna find out what's in there. We'll also see Navarro at Salal in this shot and also here with her hair looking markedly different. I've been really curious about this shot of Julia experiencing some sort of mental breakdown. Either this was cut from the season or it'll be a flashback. I think this is Peter disposing of the bodies. We'll later see him here with a pickaxe, but notice no sign of Rose. Look at these two hands here. The one on the left is Navarro, but who's on the right? I went back and checked Julie, Annie, Kayla, Rose, and Navarro's mother, and none of them have these markings on their right hand. So who could this be? If you subscribe to the Navarro is Sedna theory, maybe it's Sedna or that other part of her split personality. The background gravel also looks like it could be part of her flashback in the Middle East. Will we finally get to see Raymond Clark and is this him? Note him going down this ladder. Perhaps this tunnel was made by Oliver Tagak, the former Salal engineer. I'm also curious if this tunnel is in any way connected to Salal. Another shot of maybe Raymond dragging Navarro, but this is short-lived as we'll see Navarro duct taping Raymond. You'll see Liz's red coat on the bottom right of the screen helping her. In this wide shot, we can see a broken glass on the bottom right, likely from Liz having escaped the ice sample room. With the blizzard going on outside, it looks like Liz searches for Navarro, who is perhaps in one of those trance-like states again. Liz and Navarro make it to those ice caves. I'm really interested to see what they find. Here's a shot we haven't seen of Rose yet. Note the blizzard outside. Perhaps she's being alerted to the arrival of Pete. And finally, a shot of someone falling into the ice cave. Is this Liz, Navarro? I want to hear all of your thoughts and theories in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. And for more bad takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember, Daddy loves you very much.